Thank you guys for being here and thank you for doing this. Last week, if you were with us, we started a new series and, uh, called In My Feelings. And if you were with us last week, Pastor Sean was here and he got a chance to talk to us about joy and what joy and happiness and the difference that, uh, what that looks like. And tonight we're kind of discussing like an, a very appropriate uh, topic. And I don't know if Johnny planned it this way, but... Uh, It happened. We're going to be talking about fear tonight, okay? And so, what I want us to figure out first is there's fear can look like a few different things. For example, if you think about, like, if you want to go, if somebody tells you not to touch a hot stovetop, you're going to be afraid to touch the hot stovetop, right? Because it burns. If somebody has a dangerous dog, you're going to tell them, like, you're going to tell them, like, hey, I don't want to be near your dog because I'm afraid of it. So there's kind of like that fear that comes with, oh, like, I need to be careful, But there's also fear that comes with just everyday life. Like, I remember when I was in high school and uh, I asked a girl out for the first time, and I'm not talking about, like, those middle school dating things where you, like, kind of ask somebody out at lunch and then you date for three days and then you break up or something like that, you know? Like a real date. And uh, I remember, like, I was walking up to the girl and I saw her and, like, my hands are shaking. Like, I'm sweating. I'm, like, looking at her. I'm, like, hey. I like the way your hair looks on your head, you know? Uh, and why are my hands so sweaty, you know? And uh, I asked her out, and I think we went to a mo- I honestly don't remember. We went to a movie or something, but I was freaking out. And I think we experience fear all the time. But it's hard to put a definition on what fear actually looks like. And also what it looks like to wrestle with fear and to figure out how fear affects us as Christians. And so today we're going to dive in and see what fear actually looks like. And the first thing I want to establish is, do we experience fear? Is fear something like that we actually face? Or is it something that's just kind of blown out of proportion? It happens, or maybe we think about it in certain contexts, but it's really not that big a deal. So I want to establish where we're at with that. And I think when we consider fear, we're often thinking of the umbrella with like scary movies or haunted houses or things like that. And the thing that happens with those is like that adrenaline rush. Has anybody been to a haunted house this year? Anybody? All right. So if somebody jumps out in front of you, you're probably going to jump. You get that adrenaline rush and it kind of feels like a slap in the face. And there's like these spikes of chemicals in your body that are going off and you're, they're saying, all right, we got to do our fight or flight response. We got to do something with this. And we think, or we call that fear. There's actually a podcast out right now. It's kind of in the middle of, uh, of its releases. It's called Be Afraid. It's from a group called Christianity Today. And what they do in that podcast is they are examining horror movies and how they relate to the world and Christian faith. And I love scary movies. I watch a lot of scary movies in October. I like being scared, so there's something fun about it. Some of you guys are probably like, that is crazy. You're a crazy person. Uh, But I love it. And when we think about those things, he says that when we look at these, it really isn't fear. But when we experience jump scares or things popping out at us, that's really just our body reacting to it. What real fear looks like is When things feel dreadful, when things feel like really scary, really nervous, things feel dark, there's a lot of hard things that are coming, and you just don't know what to expect. That's fear. To have the unexpected and to have an environment where the pressure of the world around you helps you to experience the darkness that comes with that. There's a sense of terror that comes with it. And so, is that real? How, is that real to experience that? Would we say that's fear? And I think when we watch movies or if we go to haunted houses, a lot of times those are temporary. Like maybe you watch it and you have like a nightmare that night or something, but most of the time after a day or two, you'll forget about it. So when it comes to fear, I don't think that it's just scary movies. I don't think that it's just scary movies. But we have to realize that the world runs on fear. That there's more to this, that when you turn on the TV right now, you will probably see tragedy. Right now, whether it's Palestine, Israel, whether it's sickness, maybe it's global warming, maybe you turn on the TV to a news station, or your parents do, and they're talking about how to deal with some of the social problems that are happening in the world or the country right now. 
But the world loves to market fear. The world, the internet specifically, likes to sell you on fear. Because when you're looking on, uh, when you're looking on Instagram or if you're scrolling through TikTok, sure, like there's the things with the puppies or like the cute little things are happening. But more often than not, the thing that you're going to click on or that you're going to sit through the whole video is something that's hard or scary. Something that is difficult, something that you don't necessarily understand or want to be true. But you're willing to watch it because I want to know what's coming. I want to know what's happening. And God never intended the world to be this scary place, this place that is full of sin and darkness, but it is. The world can be a harsh place, and I think a lot of us know that. And some of you guys, maybe it's not even on TV, maybe it's just going out at, to school. Maybe it's scrolling through your Instagram to the, for the people that you follow. Maybe it's just a mental health thing. Maybe me talking about this has caused anxiety to bubble up in you. But the world can be a scary place, and the world loves to market on fear. So if we think about the world, I think there's one more step down that we can go. Because we recognize fear is in the world, and we want to blame the world, but I don't think it stops there. I think fear oftentimes is internal. It's something that we experience individually. More often than not, that's a fear of losing control. That's a fear of losing what we have control over. So whether that's the loss of control of the world around us, loss of control of the people around us, or even loss of control of our lives. Let me explain to you real quick. When I talk about the world around us, you can't control if somebody goes and they get, they get wasted and they get in their car and they go for a drive and they T-bone you. You can't control that. That's scary. Or if we're thinking about we can't control people, you can't control people when you tell somebody a secret or if you want to go and break up with somebody, you can't control how they're going to react. You don't know what they're going to do. That when we think about ourselves, we can't control our salvation. That's not something that's in our hands. That's not something that we can necessarily control, that we can provide for ourselves. And then it starts to happen where you start to think about, well, am I really going to be with God for eternity? Do I really have life? Is the sin I have too much for God, and I just feel like I need to keep praying this prayer over and over and over again. There's a loss of control, and the reason you do that is because it's just, it feels like you at least have something that you can control. Fear is real, and if our internal attitude is to anything to say about that, then fear can control our lives. Fear can steer the ship. Fear can be the thing that's in charge of us. That's not good, but it can be. And I think we live in an age, and you guys specifically live in an age, where fear easily can control you because of what's being told to you, because there's all these different things and these, all these different standards, and there's hard standards to meet up with. Like if you go and you look on social media and you say, I want to look like that person, and you look in the mirror and say, I don't look like that person, what's everybody going to think of me? If you go and watch whatever trashy reality TV show is on right now, and you look at the people on the screen and say, should I look like that? But, I, but you don't. What are people going to think about me? That I'm failing in this class, and this is this is hard, and I want to get into college, and my friends are getting these acceptance letters, and I haven't gotten anything yet. What's wrong with me? What if I don't get into college? These things, these fears start to swell up in us. They'll, and if you let them, they will control you. Now, I hope that wasn't too much, but I think this is very real for all of us in this room, that we all experience fear in a certain way. And the Bible actually talks quite a bit about fear. The Bible talks a little bit about different aspects of fear, and so I want to make sure to address these different aspects. So, what does the Bible have to say about fear 
the first thing that it talks about is fearing the Lord. And I think we probably hear this a lot, right? We probably hear that you're supposed to fear the Lord, but what does that exactly mean? And here I'm going to throw up some uh, verses for you guys to see where the Bible talks about that. So Psalm 111 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Proverbs says, The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. We just finished a series through the book of Ecclesiastes, and that book actually ends with this. It says, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So these passages kind of make it sound like we should fear the Lord, right? And the answer is yes, we should. God deserves to be feared, but not in the way that you probably are thinking about it. Not in the way of all the different ways that we've described. Contextually, when we're talking about fear here, we're talking about reverence, honor, honoring God for who he is. Fear God because you know who he is, that he's the great I am. That he's the perfect God, the giver of life, the offerer of salvation. But he's also the picture of justice and of judgment. Let me, let, let me talk about it like this. When you think about a judge in a courtroom, you look at the judge and you probably fear the judge whether you're on trial or not because he has the power to make the decision for those that are on trial. Or if you think about a lion... A lion, if you are at the zoo and you look at a lion in its cage, you look at that lion and you may not be in any danger at all. They're in that cage, they're, in the, they're, they're there and they're sleeping like they usually do when you go to the Akron Zoo. But you know the power that they have. You know what they could do. And that if that, if that lion got out of that cage, you probably would yield to it. You wouldn't try to fight it. That's what it looks like to fear God, is to say, I know who he is. I know his, who, what he can do. I know the life that he's given in us. I know what his ability is. I respect him and honor him for that. And it also means understanding that you know who God is, that he is loving, that he's caring, and that he wants what's best for his people. So to fear God doesn't mean that you're afraid he's going to smite you or do something like that, take you down with lightning. What it means, though, is you understand who he is and you understand the judgment that comes with him. So the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, but it also talks about the fear of the unknown. This is a different kind of fear that the Bible talks about. And I want to hit on a few passages that talk about this as well. So Proverbs says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Book of Isaiah says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Second Timothy says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. And first John four says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Fear is not something that is for the Christian. As a Christian, we should not experience fear. I mean, if you, re- right? if you read it, all of these verses and many more in the Bible tell us that fear is not something that we should be experiencing daily as Christians. Fear is something that we have been saved from. Fear is not something that we should be worried about. Fear is relegated to two things, Satan and man. These fearful things are not from God. They push us away from God. They don't point to God. They don't expose the love of God. And it doesn't expose the love of God in us. It rather shows a lack of trust in God. I remember when I came to faith. I was in eighth grade, uh, towards the end of eighth grade year, and I was and still am a huge people pleaser. It's like a daily fight that I have. And uh, I always want the people around me to be happy because if, if they're not happy, then I'm probably afraid that they don't like me. And then it's just this whole spiraling. And so I had a lot of good friends that were in youth group when I was in middle school. And then I also had a lot of good friends at school. 
but those were two separate camps. Those were two different groups of people. And so there was one point at school, I remember there was a rumor that went around about me. I honestly don't remember what it was because it was a middle school rumor and it was super dumb. But for a middle schooler, those things are a big deal. And I remember all of my friends just stopped talking to me. They wouldn't say a word to me. And I was freaking out. I was like, what do I do? My, these people won't talk to me. I need to actually, like, do something to make sure that they're happy. And so I'm trying to find all these different avenues, trying to set it up so that they won't leave me. But I was alone. I was afraid. I didn't know what to do. My anxiety got the better of me. And so at this point, I was scared. I was nervous. I was fearful. And I had to ask, well, what do I do? And so that leads me to my next point is that we establish that Christians shouldn't fear. But what I want to know is, are we allowed to experience fear? Are we allowed to experience fear? And I want to establish emotions are things that we will experience. You can't control when that emotion pops up. You can't can't just say, stop that, and it's going to stop, right? These things will happen. You will react to situations. And we all react differently, but you will react. And so my answer to this would be yes, with a little asterisk in the corner there. Yes, you can experience that, but there has to be the question, what do you do with that fear? What do you do with that fear? Will fear be something that you let take control of your life, or will it be something that you can look at and say, you have no control over me? If you let fear control your life, it will affect every aspect of how you live. School, friendships, relationships with your parents. As time starts to go on, money. As you start to think about what the future holds, when you're an adult, the decisions that you make. As you start to think about maybe getting married one day, who your spouse is going to be and what that relationship is going to look like. It will continue to develop throughout your life, and it will start to pull you down. It will drag you down, and you will have to navigate hard situations with fear, and that's never the answer. You could find everything that you want to believe in fear, that if you look to fear, it will give you answers, and those will be bad answers, but they will be answers. So when I was experiencing this moment in high school, I was so controlled by fear that I thought I was going to have zero friends. I thought nobody was going to talk to me, and I thought this was the end of the world. And all I wanted was more friends. I wanted girlfriends. I wanted these people that I could point to and say, this is my crowd. These are my people. I just wanted to be around those people. And there was the pressure was crippling. And I remember sitting in my bedroom and thinking, there's nothing. There's nothing. I don't know what I'm going to do. There's not another option. And some of you guys may be sitting in here at that point. Whatever your context is, you may be sitting in here and be thinking, there isn't any hope. I don't know what to do. That this was, this is my last option and I feel like I'm lost. That I feel like the the end of all these relationships or the end of this situation is so far from near, I just don't know what to do. So as as I close out our time, there has to be a resolution for fear. There has to be a resolution for fear. And if you're sitting here and you're feeling exhausted and you're feeling hopeless, I think that there is hope that is able to be there. The first thing that we have to recognize is what fear is. And it's a manipulation of yourself. I love the, the It movies, like the ones with the clown, the creepy clown, Pennywise, right? I think those movies are awesome. And... Uh, There's a really important moment in those movies that is vital for the story. That Pennywise, this clown, is going after this group of kids. They call themselves the Losers Club. And what what he does is he feeds off of their fears. That the things that they're afraid of, he will use and manipulate because if if they're afraid of those things and they give in to those fears, it makes him better, it makes him stronger. And what the kids learn towards the end of the movie is that They don't need to be afraid. 
that if they stop feeding this beast with their fear, then they could say, no, this is, he doesn't deserve that. He, does, he doesn't need that. And all of a sudden, as they do that, you watch, and Pennywise starts to shrink, and he starts to get small, and he starts to starve until the point that they think that they killed him. If you avoid feeding fear, it will shrivel up and die. But if you don't, it will control every aspect of your life. Second Timothy, again, says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. You have the Holy Spirit. If you are a Christian, if you are following Christ, you have the Spirit. And the Spirit that God has given you is not one of fear, not one where you should be afraid, but of one that gives life, of one that gives hope, of one that points consistently to the gospel. And so when you think of fear, when you think of the things you're afraid of, when you think about how you're afraid to just share the gospel with your friend, remember, you don't need to feed that fear because fear is what you're telling yourself or what the world's telling you is that something that does that you don't need to do because it's not worth it. When in reality, God has given you a spirit, not of fear, but one of life, one of hope. Fear is manipulation from yourself, from your sinful heart, or from Satan himself. Fear is just manipulation. So if we recognize what fear is, we have to then recognize who God is. You have to recognize who God is. And he is the loving one who would give his life for you. God is the only one who is our hope. He is the hope. It's not that like it's one of those things where you get to pick and you can stop this yourself because if you try to, it's going to feel hopeless. But if you look to God, fear will always submit to him. Isaiah talks about this. It's a specific situation, but it is relevant nonetheless. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You do not need to fear because God will give you the strength to persevere. God will give you the strength to push through. That if you are frustrated with the situation you're in, if you are fearful every day when you wake up and when you go to bed, if you look to God, he will give you the strength that you need. What that looks like, I think it's different for each of you. But he will give you the strength. He gives you a spirit of strength, of perseverance in those situations. And you don't have to fear that you're alone because you aren't. That's not who God is. That's not what he is about. He is there for you. He is with you always. And don't forget that he is the one that presents hope. And maybe you're sitting in this room and you're like, I didn't know that. I don't know what you mean by that. First John, again, says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. When I was going through this situation in high school, I was still going to church, but I wasn't living faithfully. I wasn't living a life that looked like it was given to Christ. And I remember this after a while throughout the summer. I had no friends. I sat alone in my room most days. And I finally got down on my knees and I just asked God with tears in my eyes, like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what you want from me. I don't know what you're expecting from me. And what I learned that day was that's what God wanted for me, from me. He just wanted me to come to him, to come before him to say, I need you. Because the next day, I went to first day of high school youth group, and I met the guy that would be my best friend throughout all of high school. He showed me what it looked like to live faithfully, to understand the gospel, to understand what it looked like to pursue God with all I have. God provided community for me, but all he needed for me was to come before him. And if you're sitting here and you have never heard that Jesus gave his life on the cross for your sins, for your fear, that he died and then defeated death, he resurrected three days later to destroy fear. Hear me when I say it now, there is hope. Fear does not have to control you. There is hope in the cross. So if we talk about that, we've recognized what fear is, we recognized who God is, 
The last thing that we have to do is recognize what faith is. And that's a trust in someone greater. We have to remember what faith is. Faith is trusting in our Savior. Proverbs, again, says the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Sydney says I'm really bad at this, and I think I am. But we have to put our trust in the sovereignty of God. If you don't know what sovereignty means, if you don't know what that word means, John Frame says the sovereignty of God is the fact that he is the Lord over creation. As sovereign, he ex- ex- exercises his rule. This rule is exercised through God's authority as king, his control over all things, and his presence with his covenantal people throughout the creation. Some of you guys read that and you're like, that is a lot of words that I, that I only hear in school. And so to sum it up, all that means is that God has got this. He's got this. This is my second to last gather, which is pretty wild to think about. I mean, Johnny, we told you at the end of last school year that I was transitioning out into a new job. Now that Jake has started, uh, I'm jumping into this, new, this next position at the church. And I'm excited about it. This isn't like, we need to get Alex out of the youth group kind of thing, you know, like he's got to get out of there. Uh, no, this was something that I felt God put on my heart and I'm pursuing it and I'm excited about it. But I'm also nervous. Like a lot of you guys that are sitting in this room, I've known for the last four years. Some of you guys I'm just meeting tonight. What's up? I'm glad you're here. But you guys are what's familiar to me. And I'm going to be jumping in something new, something different. And it's a little nerve-wracking. I'm scared. But in this moment, what I need to do is instead of give in to that fear and let myself spiral out of control, I trust that God is sovereign and that he's got this. And so if you're sitting here, if you are worried about what's happening, if you're worried about your life, if you're worried about what God has put before you, if you are worried about school, about friendships, about your body image, about your mental health, about what it looks like to be cool, if you are worried about the salvation that has been given to you, if you are worried that your sin is too much for God, I want to assure you right now, it's not. That offer of life is real. Hear me when I say, as Christians, we are not supposed to fear, but we will. And so the question becomes, what do we do with that fear? And that's where we trust that God is sovereign over everything. What I'm going to do in a minute here is I'm going to pray, and uh, we're going to go into some discussion groups. But what I want to encourage you guys to do is in this next set of worship, once we're done with discussion questions, I want you guys to worship hard. Give him praise, lift up your hands, lift up your voices to him. Give him the praise that he deserves. And never forget that God is sovereign over all this. If you bow your heads with me. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for emotions and the fact that we get to reflect you in that way, Lord. And that because we're fallen, because we're sinful, Lord, that our emotions can manipulate us and point us in the wrong direction. And Lord, help us to power through that, to recognize what these emotions are, and to use them for your glory. To say that fear won't control me, but Lord, I trust you. And whatever that looks like for the people in this room, whether there's people that are doing their best to faithfully follow you, or this is the first time they're hearing your gospel, Lord, give them hearts that are ready to seek after you in all that they do. And ultimately, it's because your son is working on the cross. In my name I pray. Amen.